morning, everyone, and welcome to the Resuscitation Quality Exchange Call. My name is Michelle, and I'll be your moderator for today. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them in to the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen or dialing star six to unmute your line. If you would like to zoom in to any part of the slide, use the magnifying icons on the left-hand corner of the slide. The slides and a link to the recording will be provided within one week. I will now turn the presentation over to our Regional Vice President of Quality, Cherie Boxberger. Cherie, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning, everyone. And I see we have some of you from Mountain Time, so you're up super early. So I hope everyone's been able to, to grab a cup of coffee and um, we're gonna jump in um, to the Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation Quality Exchange. And just to give you an idea, I think we've got some good content for today. Um, Got to move something on the screen here. All right, so this will be our agenda for today. Um, we are going to, we have a guest speaker in Allie Bateman who handles our um, community CPR program through American Heart. So I think that that'll be something that's interesting. We'll look at our performance overall as an affiliate. I do want to talk a little more closely. Some of you may have attended the webinar about the new feature that's being integrated into Get With The Guidelines resuscitation related to in-hospital cardiac arrest. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, I wanna be able to talk to you a little bit about um, reporting, looking at some different things by unit, as well as the new code blue package of reports. And then of course, we'll look at dates and times. And um, you always seem to be good at getting those questions out there that you're struggling with that we may be able to help you with. So just as a reminder, certainly um, our goals as, as, well, all of us actually, are to double survival from in-hospital cardiac arrest as well as double survival um, in the outpatient setting. You know that in the outpatient setting or in, at, uh, not in the hospital, it's single-digit survival. And so the things that are there that are important are certainly going to be bystander CPR, is gonna be a critical element, as well as CPR quality and provision of guideline-directed therapies. In the hospital, it's a similar situation. So with Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation, we're always looking to make sure that our patients are getting the right therapies in the right time, and certainly CPR quality also ties in there. So just to kind of, and I'm sorry this is a little bit um, foggy, but to kind of give you an idea of how these things tie together, um, we have, kind of three intermingling um, areas of American Heart. The top one there is called RQI. For those of you who are, aren't familiar, that's called Resuscitation Quality Improvement. And that is um, our actually CPR competency program where hospitals are able to um, be able to use some tools at the hospital where they're going to practice their CPR skills quarterly. So it basically makes the biannual uh, class <laughs> go away, and instead our professionals are utilizing RQI stations in the hospital, and quarterly they're doing a portion of their training. And so, of course, it's um, self-driven, it's autonomous, so you are achieving um, success um, on your own and getting feedback from the simulation devices. And there's a picture of the cart there. If anybody's interested in doing this, this is not something that is limited to only large hospitals. In fact, uh, a number of small hospitals have adopted RQI. So um, we're not gonna talk any more about it today, but if you would like um, to see it or get more information about what that um, would involve, uh, please just uh, email us at SWA, Southwest Affiliate, SWA quality at heart.org. Of course, you all know about Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation, um, the largest um, registry of, of its type in the country. Very excited to let you know that we just passed the 1 million CPA um, entries in the registry, so a very valuable tool to continue our um, research around Code Blue around um, respiratory arrest as well as MET team engagement. So you guys know about that. And then a very important element is community CPR because we need to not only be sure that our general community knows um, CPR and has, has excellent skills, 
but also that your high-risk patients are going home with the proper skills. So we've asked um, Allie Bateman to join us today because she coordinates all of our um, CPR in the community efforts. And um, she's going to tell us what's new and how some things you may not have been aware of as a hospital that you can take advantage of. So, uh, Michelle, can you hook it up so Allie can move her slides? I think I'm ready. Can you guys hear me okay? We got gotcha. you. Awesome. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone is having a good day so far. Um, my name is Allie Bateman. I am the Community CPR Manager for the Southwest Affiliate for the American Heart Association. Um, I am based in Dallas, Texas, but my region is pretty big. I cover a six-state region, including Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. So I am very lucky, and I get to travel to all those places and interact um, with different healthcare providers and community members to make sure that our bystander rate in our community is growing because us, too, and our team has a huge goal um, to double the bystander rate by 2020. And 2020 is quickly approaching. So I'm going to talk a little bit of kind of what I do, what are my goals, and how you can kind of help um, be a little piece of the big puzzle raising our bystander rate. So Nancy Brown um, in 2015, our CEO, set out a goal called our ECC 2020 impact goals. And basically that was for us to double our statistics. And you can see on the slide, I am really focused on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, meaning I am trying to get our bystanders, the non-healthcare providers, the non-first responders, just your everyday average Joes, to learn the saving skill of CPR. And what we were noticing is people knew what CPR was, they could, you know, define it, but they didn't feel comfortable performing CPR on a layperson for a couple reasons. First reason being they really didn't know how, and second reason being they were scared. So our whole program, and specifically CPR Anytime, is really to empower people to participate in handling CPR if they see a cardiac arrest. And what we were noticing um, in our data was 70% of these cardiac arrests were happening in the house. So they weren't really happening in a public setting where maybe by chance you were around a nurse or a doctor or someone who knew CPR. So left and right, we saw people having cardiac arrest in their household and their family members not knowing, not knowing what to do. And in some parts of the country, especially in our rural areas, it was taking our first responders over 10 minutes to get to them. And as we know, as that time is very precious. So we really want to make sure that people have these skills so they can step in until those first responders get there and we can keep, you know, the heart pumping and the brain staying alive um, so their chance of survival is even greater than before. So we were challenged with raising the out-of-hospital um, cardiac arrest survival rate from 7.9% to 15.8%. Um, as of today, we're at about 12% right now. So we're almost getting there. We definitely made a significant increase, but we won't get that last data until 2020. So I can't wait to report back to you guys during that time frame how well we did do um, with our impact goals. And then our second, which is probably the most critical component, is doubling our out-of-hospital by standard rate nationally. Um, so right now, um, we want to go from 31% to 62%. It's staggering around 46% right now. We haven't really seen a jump and an increase in the last two years, but we're hoping with all our efforts um, we will be able to kind of push through and hit that 62%. Um, by the end of next year, so we will see. And then our last one was increasing training from 12.3 million to 20 million. And training is really a loose term. Um, within AHA, training counts as, you know, doing a full-on CPR certification class, RQI, and it can even be watching a video on YouTube. We count that as training. So really just anyone whose eyes are on a CPR video, um, we log that as an official training. Because we can't really, you know, go across the computer screen and see exactly what they're doing, we just assume that they're retaining some sort of information within our videos, and we have multiple um, feedback and surveys that go out to the public to kind of see how well we are trending with our training materials online. So the next point I want to talk about is kind of where we lie in the cardiac arrest chain of survival. So. 
um, Get With the Guidelines is obviously a fantastic program, but they're a little later down the road in the chain of survival. Um, I'm right in the beginning. So as you can see on the slide, I'm the community CPR champion. So I am living in the world of recognition and activation of the emergency response system and then performing immediately high quality CPR. And in my world, we just focus on hands-only CPR. So we're just focusing on hands on the chest and pushing as fast as you can. So we're not getting into the nitty gritty of doing um, breaths or bag air. Uh, we are just doing straight on compressions because what we were noticing is people didn't do CPR because they mostly just didn't want to do mouth to mouth. And obviously as the science shows, that common people just really weren't good at mouth to mouth anyway. So they just kind of took it out of our guidelines um, in 2015 and said that for only hands only CPR, you are allowed to just do compressions. You do not have to do mouth to mouth resuscitation, but anything above our certification products like Heart Saver, like BLS, ACLS, obviously you're doing mouth to mouth resuscitation um, with a mask or a bag. So that's kind of why we're different. Um, we just want to make it as simple as possible. So our um, common people can remember it and that's kind of what we're pushing and I love how we touched on earlier that we really want to focus on our high-risk patients because obviously as we know there are chances of getting another cardiac arrest or event after they um, get released from the hospital is extremely high those are extremely valuable months so we want to make sure that they are prepared and that their families prepared in case something happens so how we could achieve this is through our product called CPR Anytime. And CPR Anytime, how I like to describe it, is basically CPR in a box. And this is a fantastic product that we use. And the best part about this product is we really try to give it away for free. So we have a lot of great donors, a great network of foundations who support the American Heart Association on all levels. And primarily we're seeing that they want to give back to the community in a tangible way. And how they can do that is by donating um, CPR anytime to our local hospital systems, to our local YMCA's, to our school systems, really anywhere you eat, play, and pray, that's kind of where we want CPR anytime to be. It's a 20-minute course. It comes in a little box, and it has a mannequin inside it. And basically what you do is you can practice compressions on the mannequin, but the great part of it is it comes with a DVD. And that DVD, you can just pop in the DVD player, and it can teach you CPR in 20 minutes. And it's a very simple layman's term course. It's not super sciencey. It breaks it down super simple and slow for anyone to understand from any language, from any part of the world, and at any age. Um, and now, recently, as in last Monday, this course is now um, can be live streamed. So you do not have to have a DVD player to do this, which is fantastic. We're now in the 20th century, um, and you can doubt, and you can watch it straight on your computer, or if you can live stream through your TV, if you have a smart TV, you can do that as well. And where we really see these kind of exploding is in employee training. So a lot of corporations around our affiliates are adopting this program and training their employees on how to do hands-only CPR because they were noticing that people who were having heart attacks and cardiac arrests left and right in the workplace and no one knew what to do. And also you have the fancy AEDs hanging on the wall, but no one knew what an AED was or how to activate it. So that's become a huge hit in the last year or two. And then community training. So the American Heart Association hosts a bunch of trainings throughout the year um, called Save a Life Trainings, where we can implement or get, you know, 1,000, 2,000 of these kits and then place them in the community somewhere. Um, and these kind of spaces, we like to place them in high-risk neighborhoods. So we have a fantastic you know, team called our community impact team within the American Heart Association who tries to identify those high-risk zip codes that have either little response rates, as in they don't call 911, or um, if they see a cardiac arrest, they're too afraid to call 911, or um, they do call 911, but they don't do compression. So we're trying to focus on them activating 911 and then putting hands on the chest as fast as they can, um, but can also go to anywhere in the community. It doesn't have to go into high-risk neighborhoods, can go you know, to your mom and dad's shop down the street or can go into, you know, the local school system. It really doesn't matter. And the last one, which I think is the most important one, is our cardiac rehab centers. So as you guys know, when people leave the hospital, they usually are set on some sort of um, action plan of how to get better and how to get more healthier and stronger. Um, during that action plan, we really think education is probably the most key component of this because they are learning so much information. It's a bit of a scary time for them, but we want them to be safe and we want their family to feel like they're going to be okay. And how we can empower them to feel like that is by introducing them CPR anytime. And 
we have found that this has really truly have saved lives. We have a research study going on right now, and the data um, is about to be published within the next couple months. Um, but what we're seeing that you know the survival rates after um, out of hospital cardiac arrest and them knowing CPR anytime has really helped the family members you know bring their family members back and um, truly bring them home from the hospital again. <laughs> So that's kind of where we've been seeing it. We've also been placing it in um, high-risk um, NICUs across um, the United States. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, it's called Infant CPR Anytime. So our Anytime product is broken out into two sections. It has an adult section and then it has an infant section. Um, they don't come in the same kit, but they're two separate programs. Um, and they're the same price. So you can buy them for the same price or they can be funded for the same price. And with Infant CPR Anytime, this is probably my favorite product by far because who doesn't love babies? Um, we love to place these in NICUs, PICUs across the United States or put them in programs with high-risk mothers. So we have been implementing them in WIC programs um, across our affiliate. And also we have been placing them in communities that probably don't have access to these education systems. So teen pregnancy, um, local community centers who have you know, young mothers or high-risk mother programs. Um, we've been teaching them how to do just a simple step, same as adult CPR time. It takes 20 minutes, comes with a little baby infant with a cute little diaper on it, and they can learn how to do hands-only CPR within, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And we're loving this program, and we're seeing a lot of great feedback from it as well. And it's also a great opportunity to teach those family members who can't really afford it. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the pricing, but sometimes to take an infant CPR class or a grandparent class, Nowadays, it's about $25 to $50 at a local hospital system, which is sometimes pricey for some families. So we want to replace that cost. And we have a lot, a lot of foundation and donors who love this project. And they are um, supporting NICUs across the United States. So if you guys know any NICUs or PICUs or centers where you think who can benefit from these products but can't afford them straight offline, please let me know and reach out to me because I am more than happy to kind of set you up with a donor connection or to help implement that program free of price because um, we do that all the time and that's kind of one of my favorite parts of my job. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So that's kind of really um, how the CPR Anytime programming works. Um, like I said, 90% of our products we give out for free. We do not um, you know, buy, um, sell them for retail price, um, mostly because um, the way that our team is structured is that we have a very high restricted revenue goal, meaning that 90% of my time I'm out there looking for donors and foundations to fund these amazing programs and making sure that no one um, doesn't know CPR because they can't afford it. I think that's the number one challenge, and we do not want that here. Um, there's no way we're going to be able to move our bystander rate right if we are not educating um, the public and giving them those tools and resources. And then more importantly, just kind of educating that you don't have to be a doctor or a healthcare provider to do CPR. I think that's probably the number one challenge. Um, and I can't tell you how, it, how rewarding it is when you're training someone in CPR and they get that feeling of, wow, I can actually do this and I have the power to do this. I think that's the most um, rewarding experience of all this. So if you guys have any programs that you think would benefit from CPR anytime, um, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help and support. And I think that's it for me today, but I will take any questions if anyone has any. No. I know they're thinking about their while they're thinking about their questions, Allie, I mean, they could actually have their own hospital foundation consider funding this for their own absolutely. NICUs or ICUs, and you could help them with uh, that as well, right? Yes, yes absolutely. Um, a lot of the hospital foundations um, love this program as well, and we can kind of walk you through how that goes. Um, usually on the AHA side, we do the applying for you, so we do all the busy work. All we need from you guys is that connection as to who is at the hospital foundation and then just a letter of support from whoever is going to be hosting the CPR Anytime program within their NICU. So usually a NICU director, a PICU director, or sometimes the head cardiac rehab nurse. It really just depends on the hospital system, but we just need that, you know, go ahead from you guys and that connection and we can make it work. Now, if you want to ask a question in person, just star six or Michelle, are there any typed in in the Q&A? Not so far. All right. Well, jot down Allie's um, information. I think you'll find her a very helpful um, uh, partner in this because there are ways for us just to continue to expand and get this program out, whether that be inside your hospital for all your NICU parents or it be in a community center that's nearby your hospital and you know they would benefit 
because certainly our patients are going to be um, in a better situation when they reach the hospital if there's been bystander CPR. So thank you so much, Allie. Um, last call for any questions. And don't hesitate, even if you think of one, type it in and we'll get an answer from Allie um, and return it to you in writing. So if you think of something, uh, do uh, type that in. Thanks so much, Allie. All right. Uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, the world of CPR has changed so much. I um, remember doing the training in the uh, 80s and we had all this giant uh, recessa annies. I know there's people on who did that, that we had to clean with all this Clorox and everything. Um, so it's just so fantastic to see these little kits, especially when um, you bring home a high-risk baby and you want the grandparents to be trained, any babysitters, aunts, uncles, siblings. Um, so you can just take this kit home and expand how many people uh, know how to do the skill, um, especially in the babies that have, have had a little slower start in getting out of the hospital. All righty, well, we're going to jump to um, Southwest Affiliate Performance as it relates to Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation and our guideline-directed therapies. You all should have, um, within the last two weeks, the week of the 14th, we sent out reports to every single hospital who has Get With the Guidelines across all modules. and um, and it was a snapshot. Now, sometimes it's a little confusing because you have done a lot of work before you get your report and you're like, this isn't right. So, so that you know, the only way we can kind of make this work is we take a snapshot in time, we take all your data, and that, that time happened to be January 1st. So everything that was abstracted on January 1st was in your report. Now, some of you I know had done additional work, so work with your directors to get an updated report. But here we're looking at the performance across the entire year, and we know not everyone has done with their 2018 um, discharges. But you can see this is Q1, 2, 3, 4, and an aggregate. So for each of these measures, you are seeing um, the performance by the Southwest Affiliate, all six states, hospitals that are participating and get with the guidelines resuscitation. And so we're seeing great improvement. These are in a little different order than you're familiar with, but we'll cover them in the order they're on this chart. The um, confirmation of airway device placement, and I'm gonna talk a little more about that on tips and tricks for figuring out where that's occurring, but doing much better. This is the changed measure. Last year, you were able to um, confirm the airway in the original location say the ED, and when they came to the ICU, then there wasn't a requirement that that be documented and checked again. Well, just from a logical standpoint, you can see how important it would be to double check that with the jostling of a patient from ED to ICU or from one ICU to a different, uh, different ICU. And you do need to confirm that airway by a method that's more than just uh, listening either eyeball it or use cathnography, and then it needs to be documented. I'm under the impression that in a lot of places, this simply is not being documented, and that's where we're, we're down. So if any of you are struggling on this, call your director, and let's run this by unit. Let's run it um, in different ways. What we're finding is the majority of these misses are in the ICU, and we believe it's not because it's not being done, because it's not being documented. So we are glad to help with that. But you can see that we're on a trajectory as an affiliate improving in that. Um, certainly, um, time to epi uh, for our non-shockable uh, patients, doing great. That's something that, and of course, with that five-minute requirement. And these are the adult measures, by the way. I'll show you the um, other um, categories. The time to shock, very important. Um, I, we've kind of been up and down in that. We are not meeting what, you know, we'd like to see 85% um, in this category. And so certainly, again, looking what are those time to shock? I've run some reports for some different hospitals and found that the majority of these are in non-cardiac units where the, the shock is delayed. They may be in the middle of the night where your staffing is down. Um, and, and I will encourage you to run the code blue report because it basically breaks down these things by the hour of the day, by the day of the week, um, by the unit, by the unit type. 
Um, so that is a new report, and it's called the Code Blue Bundle. So we'll talk about that a little more. And then, of course, you want to get as many patients as possible into a place where, um, if they are high risk, that they're monitored or witnessed. So any questions as it relates to these four key measures, again, to be recognized for 2018 data, each of these needs to be an aggregate of 85% or above. Um, so any questions or roadblocks, things that you want to know, type them into Q&A or star six. Any questions, Michelle? Not so far. All right. Now, I know some of you perhaps are only doing the adult measures. Just as a reminder, um, this program has four age groups, kind of based on the science and the guidelines, because that's how the guidelines have been divided up. Adult, which is going to be your patients over 18 years of age. Pediatric, which is going to be your children 1 to 18. Then you have your infant which is going to be greater than 24 hours to one year, and then the category of newly born. So I encourage you, if you have only done adult, but you have these other patient categories, perhaps pick one of them um, to also begin to abstract and look at your quality. Perhaps the newly born area um, would be a place to start if you'd only been doing adult and tying in um, those professionals. Uh, the uh, measures are just a teeny bit different, and um, again, airway confirmation is, is a common, time to epi is common, but we are, it's really critical that we're getting to compressions with minute or less in these pediatric patients. But you can see, and now we don't have, um, we don't have hundreds of um, pediatric hospitals in here, but we have a good number, and you can see that those hospitals are doing an excellent job. Um, with the, getting the CPR in less than a minute, especially with the pediatric. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we're putting the right patients in ICU versus a general ward setting. So again, looking very well, and I encourage those of you who are not doing this work to uh, and consider extending your quality program to include them. Here's your neonate infants. So just as a reminder, again, these are babies that are over 24 hours. It's not an event on their, on their birth. It's after that, so 24 hours to one year. Um, again, similar, the same as the, as the little older kids. And we're doing very well. Um, had a, a little bit down in the time to compressions in the fourth quarter, but again, I don't believe all hospitals have completed their 2018 discharge abstraction. And then you're newly born, and they have a little bit different guidelines. Um, even if you're not going to abstract uh, the patients in to get with the guidelines, I would encourage you to get the guidelines and look at them and make sure that these things are being measured in your um, newly born area. So, of course, confirmation of airway, because we want to make sure we're getting good oxygen. Time to positive pressure ventilation. That needs to happen very quickly. These are your, your brand new babies. The advanced airway is put in before the chest compressions, and then um, pulse oximetry is in place prior to the chest compressions as well. So that is a very tight time frame to do um, interventions. Of course, um, your new baby professionals are used to these, <laughs> these uh, crises as it relates to this. So these are your newly borns and the guidelines for those. So, as I said, make sure that your, um, your OB department is utilizing these in their, in their uh, baby nurseries or through their, your OB policies. Any questions about the measures? I want to real quick, and I don't know how many of you attended the webinar, about um, in-hospital cardiac arrest and what we're going to be working on as it relates to the American heart, but it does impact you greatly. You know that already, as a participant in Get With the Guidelines resuscitation, that you receive an annual risk-adjusted survival report. And that report is something um, that you really can't get anywhere else. It's based on 
um, an index of, I believe, nine to 11 um, characteristics that truly indicate um, the risk to survive. So it's not, it's an apples to apples comparison and very difficult if you were to uh, try to get that yourself. So um, we're going to be adding another report called a prevalence report. And we had a national, a national webinar just to emphasize, and I'm gonna run through these, so don't hang up if you were like, oh, I was on that web. I'm just gonna, I pulled out about a few of the slides and just wanna update all of you. So they added prevention to the in-hospital cardiac arrest chain of survival in 2015. And that was kind of based on the Institute of Medicine report that said we could save 50,000 lives if we did some, some different things in in-hospital cardiac arrest. And um, we know that just measuring the outcome, did they live, of in-hospital cardiac arrest is really not enough. We need to do that. But there were other things um, based on the literature review that impact if a patient survives, including the nurse bed staffing ratios, if there's a bed available in the ICU. It was interesting in this study that when there are patients deteriorating nearby, then other patients deteriorate. So that's a kind of an interesting element, as well as how you're working your rapid response or MET team. So we knew it wasn't just enough to look at survival only. We need to look at it, but there's other elements. Now, this is where we, they started looking at incidents. So how often are cardiac arrests occurring? And you can see here, huge variation as it relates to the number of cardiac arrests per thousand admissions. And all of you are quality professionals, so you know that when there's variation, there's probably reduced quality. So this really showed us that we needed to um, look at this more closely. And not just as a nation, but as the world. Um, here's the regional distribution of in-hospital cardiac arrest by state. Again, a lot of variation from 6.31 to 0.86. So, so much variation across the country. So um, what happened last summer in the international resuscitation community was a recommendation that across the world, and this was at the third international consensus conference on rapid response, that we should be looking at non-ICU, non-procedural in-hospital cardiac arrest per 10,000 adult ward days. So what does that mean? We want to know can we reduce the number of cardiac arrests that happen in non-ICU settings? So, you know, we're putting patients into the, into the wrong part of the hospital. So that was made, that recommendation was made internationally. And um, they looked at different things that they could measure, um, how you could measure this, and came up with they wanted to do the ward, and they call it ward, or the non-ICU unit, in hospital cardiac arrest per 10,000 ward days. So that's what we're going to be pursuing. And so you know we are going to, we, the American Heart Association, and our national um, guiding committee, our clinical committee, is working diligently to set a U.S. accreditation standard for cardiac arrest for hospital and healthcare systems. And it is going to be this recommended international number. So. A, um, a required, we're going to be asking for a required reporting measure for all hospitals. You are getting in ahead of the game because you're already working on your, your um, cardiac arrest processes. And so this is a few of the reasons why American Heart Association is doing this. First of all, we've got that report that came from Institute of Med Medicine that we could save 50,000 lives. And one of those, the recommendation for was that we I think we might have lost Cherie. But in the meantime, I do want to call attention to our uh, deadline. So remember to have all your data in uh, for resuscitation. It's going to be a little different date. Cherie will talk about it a little bit more uh, at the end of her presentation. But uh, we are working together with your directors to try to get all your data plugged in for award season coming up. If you have any questions, you should have also received a email from your director regarding all your data. Take a close look at it, look over the quarters. If there's a quarter you're struggling with, uh, reach out to your director so we could get it all corrected before the deadline for our abstraction.
while we wait for Sharita to hop back on the call, uh, we still have Allie on the call. If anyone else had any questions regarding CPR. I would like to say that if any hospital systems on the call are participating and get with the guidelines and or RQI, CPR anytime is a great component to kind of add to your hospital system. Um, one of the goals in our affiliate is wanting to make comprehensive resuscitation hospitals, meaning that every part of the hospital is participating in some sort of proactive cardiac response system, whether that's in hospital, out of hospital, or just overall improving the stats um, competency in resuscitation. Um, so I think that's a great thing to add to your program. And like I said, hospital foundations um, eat that kind of stuff up. So if you guys are interested in something like that, please let me know um, because we can look for funders to support that specifically. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Allie, for hopping in there. Um, Verizon has it out for me. They just don't want me to stay on the phone. Um, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, we can. Okay, <laughs> uh, so sorry, everyone. Um, and thank you, Allie, for jumping in. That sounds like um, that's really good information. I appreciate that. Um, so we're, we're talking about why we'd want to have a national uh, measurement for survival. You know, we have national measurements for all sorts of things as it relates to infections, as it relates to um, other uh, readmission, but it's kind of unusual that we don't have one for this. And so certainly in trying to double it, that that would be a reason to have an international or an a national number. And then, oh, that's what I just talked about. We have other things that we have reported, and those have led to improvements. So um, this is the, the path we're on. So I'll go ahead, um, and we know that cardiac arrest survival is generally uh, higher when it occurs in a, a critical care setting. Um, but we know that uh, Thirty-three percent of arrests happen outside of an ICU, so that is another reason that we want to encourage this. And um, oh, and also the incidents. Um, if, if these things aren't followed, that's a reason that the incidents uh, may be higher. Is that we haven't got the the information proper into that that we don't know they had the do not resuscitate. So. So anyway, that's what we're doing. We have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest information now through CARES, through ROC. Um, it is voluntary, but we don't have a centralized data element. We have Get With the Guidelines, but it's also limited and partial data, and we don't know about what other hospitals are collecting, and there's no standardized measure. So our goal is that in the future state that we would have standardized measures of which we'd like to start with risk-adjusted survival and incidence of cardiac arrest. So what does this mean to you? It means we need something from you because we want to give you a prevalence report for your hospital. And we just need a little bit of information about bed days on your unit in order to be able to provide that. So um, this is where we need you to help us. We have a deadline of February 15th for you to get all of your data in. And then let me get to this page. Oh, huh. Everything is giant on this page. Let me try. You can't see the whole thing, right, Michelle? How about now? I can see report overview. Reports That's overview. All you can. Hmm. And I see all the wording underneath. You can see it now? Okay, good. It was giant, so I couldn't tell what people could see. So anyway, what we need, what this report will be is an annual incidence of adult in-hospital cardiac arrest, non-critical care areas per 10,000 adult non-critical bed days. And um, we need to have a little bit of information that you can put into your PMT that will allow us to calculate this. And we need to have you put those numbers in there by February 15th. Now, this is optional. Um, if, you, if you aren't able to get these numbers, and you'll see it's not very many, then um, don't worry about it. But we probably are going to make this a requirement next year, and, and this is something you'll have to collect every year. 
Um, but I think you'll find that it's not um, a difficult thing. And I'm going to be sending out with this, and you should have gotten this before, the printable CRF and the data definitions of what we need. Now, let me show you, for those of you who haven't seen this, what we need you to do is go into this portion of your PMP, My Hospital Characteristics, and we need you to click on Update Recess Site Characteristics. And you should be doing this all the time anyway. This is a section that determines who your benchmarks are, if you want to compare to hospitals with similar beds, if you want to be in the Children's Hospital um, benchmarking group, if you're a part of that organization. Um, so anyway, this is an important place to go anyway. But we need, this is the information we need. We need med surge bed days, pediatric ward bed days, your total admissions, um, as well as some ICU bed day information. In our FAQ, we are suggesting that this is something you usually can get through the part of your hospital that provides your analytics of your patients, which patients are making money, losing money, looking at your ratios and staffing. Um, this, uh, this is information you should be able to get in the FAQ, which we'll send out with the slides from this. And if you attended the webinar, you already should have. It tells you what's a pediatric ward day. What do you do with cath lab? What do you do with, and the FAQ walks you through. So all we need you to do is to put your name and number here and enter in this these pieces of information by February 15th. If you do that and you complete your abstraction, you will get within the next couple of months a report customized to you on prevalence, and you will get uh, your risk-adjusted survival report. Your director of quality can help you with this, so reach out to them and they'll walk you through this, walk you through the FAQ um, so that you know what numbers you need, but and we are interested in how hard it is for you to get this information. Um, we've had different people tell us. Some thought it was easy, and some said they had a bugger of a time getting it. So um, we want to be able to adjust this and not make a huge burden on you. But I think this will be a very valuable report. What questions do you have about this? Um, star six, or you can kind of type them in. Anything um, you have yet, Michelle? No, nope, we're a quiet group today. I know. Well, that's because I saw a bunch that are on Mountain Time, so they're only on 743. Okay, well, we are going to be, you may, I should let you know that we have a part of our company, American Heart Association, it's a customer service phone bank that makes outbound calls. It is possible, because we want to have as high a percentage as we can of this, it's possible that you'll receive a phone call from our customer service area asking for you if you've had an opportunity to get this information. We also will be reaching out to you, to, for those of you who have not completed this, and asking you to consider collecting it. Um, this will really help us in the baseline of the research that we need. Um, you know that in resuscitation, there's not a lot of good class 1A recommendations because it's an area where withholding a treatment isn't something we would do. We wouldn't check what happens when you do get CPR and when you don't get CPR, when you do get an airway or you don't. So um, this kind of registry study is very important. So if you would please consider um, gathering this information, talking to your business office and getting this and getting it entered in here. Very important, and I almost missed it. Notice this red arrow. If you put it all in there and you just leave, it will not be in there. You have to push save changes. So don't forget to click save changes. Um, da, da, da. Oh, and the data definitions are also in the coding instructions. So you'll have an FAQ, but you can also click on coding instructions if you want to look at the specific data definitions for um, PED ward, you know, the, the things that we're asking in the previous screen. And then um, in there, it can link you to the site characteristics. So if you're inside coding instructions, you can get to where we just were um, by clicking here, and I'll take you back to, to uh, the place where you enter the data. I um, 
encourage you to please um, consider getting these in. Just a few notes. Um, all inpatients and observation patients will be included, because they'll ask you this when you're talking to the business office. For, bed, for med surge bed days, the number of occupied bed days in those non-procedural, non-critical licensed beds, and this is the dates we need, January 1st through the 31st. Um, these are straightforward. That gives the ages that we want for the different age groups. Um, again, pretty straightforward, um, but they're looking at occupied bed days in all intensive care units, adult intensive care units. That's what adult ICU bed days. I know some of you have 15 ICUs. So all of these um, are in the FAQ and we'll also have them in these slides. And as I mentioned, you can start with your finance office or your business office. These are a variety of places that we have found this information in the hospital system I came from. We did have a business intelligence office and that's where I definitely would have gotten um, this information. And da, 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 da. Oh, and this is the information that drives your daily census report. So if you know where your daily census report comes out, the one that comes out after midnight, go to that person because they're basically expanding it for the whole year. So um, just another idea. Um, these are our specific contacts related to get with the guidelines resuscitation, but I would encourage you just to use your, um, your director of quality that you have as well at, or um, contact SWA quality at heart.org and we'll help you. All right, and we do want to thank you. You know, you're participating. This is the only national cardiovascular registry. It's been going since 2001 or two. originally started as NRCPR, and I can't tell you how much your participation makes a difference to our national research. So I know it's not cheap for you to put this information in, but we do feel like it, it is a helpful piece of information. Before we jump to these important dates, um, I wanted to um, just remind you about the filter component of your um, Get With The Guidelines reporting system. I would encourage you, and I should have done a slide for this, I'll send it out when we send out the slides, but you can filter any of your measures by the units where those misses are occurring. So if you are missing on, on the airway confirmation, you can actually go down and open up filter and you can select all your units and compare them and you can see which unit is having the fallout. And by doing that, and we're finding that most hospitals aren't gonna have to do hospital-wide education, they just have to go to a particular kind of unit. So I wanted, if you would like to see filtering for your data, please reach out to your director of quality. You should know who they are by looking back at your day-to-day's report that you got uh, the week of the 14th and, um, and just do a reply and say you'd like to know more about reporting because um, those directors can really help you. Here's your dates, important dates, February 15th. Please, please, please complete your site update and finish your data abstraction. And that will make sure that you get your risk standardized survival report and your new prevalence report. I know you're gonna find those helpful to your Code Blue team and others. Um, remember that if you don't do that, but you still want to get recognized, then we would like you to be able to finish your data by March 1st. That will allow us to work with you all during the month of March to make sure you are, are you're, um, if, that if you're eligible that you're going to be recognized. But bottom line, the very last day to finish 2018 is March 29th. So I'm encouraging you to finish as soon as possible, work with your director, see how your numbers look, because we want to make sure that you can get recognized if you've been working hard on this. And a special note, once your director has confirmed everything looks good, do not edit or adjust your 2018 data. You can do anything you want with 2019, but um, once they've said everything looks good, don't try to go back in there and tweak things. And if you do, ask your director to run your report again. Because what happens is on early April, they just pull the numbers out of the system. We don't have, there's not a human element of that. <laughs> and so if you've changed something and it's changed your performance percentage, um, that will flow up. So uh, don't mess with it once it looks good. 
I do want to remind you about um, a new progr a program called QCore, that's Quality of Care and Outcomes Research Conference on April 5th and 6th, and this is in the D.C. area. Um, it is the venue, and it says heart failure. I shouldn't have carried that over. It's also um, going to be a place where we're recognizing um, our resuscitation awards as well um, at a recognition event for silver and gold. So I apologize. It's, it is going to include heart failure as well as um, CAD, coronary artery disease, AFib, and um, also resuscitation. So all your work you've done, um, the recognition awards will come out and be distributed in May or early June. And then um, this kind of gives you the idea when your Q1, et cetera, the data is out there. So that is what we are working on. What questions do you have? What things are you working on? We have a few minutes if you've got process improvement groups that are working or, or have had um, results from one of your process improvement groups. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Things to share might be if you're working on hot debrief, how that's gone. If you have been doing anything to diminish the chaos during a code, something that's worked or something that hasn't worked, um, jump on. We've got a good group and tell us what you're working on and share with your colleagues. You just star six and you'll be live. Boast on yourself. And Michelle, take a peek and see if we have any questions in the question line while they're thinking. All right. Well, I am interested in hearing what you're working on. Um, I would, our, your directors would love to coordinate with you and see if, if you've had a successful project and you want to um, put them in abstract form and be able to share them, for instance, in a poster session at one of our American Heart Association conferences. We'd love to help you do this. All of you are researchers. You just don't know it. And we are so happy to help you um, get started in presenting some of what you are studying at your own hospital. I won't belabor the point. Um, one more check with Michelle. No questions? No questions. All right. Well, um, we will give you seven minutes of your, of your hour back. I, again, want to thank you for using Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation. This is a really important time to wrap up those 2018 abstractions and um, get that done by the 15th, and um, you'll be on to 2019. Thanks for all that you're doing. I really think we're making strides to double the survival, and we wouldn't be able to do it without each of you. So um, as Michelle said, all of this will be sent out to you within the week, including the instructions. But if you need them sooner, just reply to your day-to-day's report and tell them you want the stuff for the site characteristics today, and your director will get it sent out to you. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.